today. I'm glad to have Andre Kostin here today. And um, he studied computer science in Bucharest and uh, recently finished his PhD um, on security and embedded systems. And he's done some pretty cool hacks. Uh, maybe some of you have looked him up. And um, he's the author of the toolkit MyFair Classical Universal Toolkit, uh, which enables you to crack RFID chips, basically. And he will talk about uh, methods on how to make large-scale security analysis of embedded devices possible. So enjoy and give a warm welcome to Andre. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Thank you, Christian, for introducing me. Uh, to, my name is Andre Costin. I am a recent PhD graduate from URICOM in south of France. And today I'll be presenting you uh, basically the quick squeeze of my three years thesis on security of embedded devices, firmware, how to do it fast and furious at large scale with some demos. So a very short who am I? I'll not go too much, but in principle, I'm interested in embedded devices uh, as such, regardless of the shape they take. They might take the shape of a RFID card or a credit card, or they take shapes of printers or funky CCTV cameras or even airplanes. All these are kind of examples of embedded devices fit in different bodies, let's say. But inside, they're embedded devices, and this is what makes them a little bit different than normal PCs and interesting for me. So we know that embedded devices are everywhere. It's not something new, and we are seeing this. We, we use them every day. We see that embedded, embedded devices, they are getting more complex and smarter because we really want to uh, do more useful stuff with them, like writing a script for them, or calling an API, or uh, trying to, to run some, uh, some piece of advanced software on them, whether it's a smart home or a smart TV. And of course, embedded devices, they are also getting, on top of that, they are also getting interconnected in what's the new buzzword, Internet of Things, IoT. And these layers of complexity, basically the interconnection of devices which before were not supposed to, to be connected, uh, combined with new complexity of software and stacks and APIs, makes it a little bit uh, harder to actually understand all the security surfaces. So it, it requires a little bit of a systematic approach. Um, all these embedded uh, devices, they run software, and regardless of their shape, how they look like, their software is uh, called firmware. Uh, because of historical reasons, so your uh, smart TV, your uh, smart meters, your home, home router, and even your hard drives in your PC or network cards in your PC, they run these pieces of firmware, which is kind of a smaller set software operating system or not running inside of it. So there are some observations at, at present that back in 2014 we've seen at least in a part of the internet, which is just a small observable part, that there are hundreds of thousands of firmware packages which we've been able to, to download and partially to unpack and analyze. So there might be many more thousands of firmware packages, but at least we know there are hundreds of thousands of them. And there's also these interesting predictions that by 2014, there, there were 14 billion interconnected objects by Cisco Internet of Things connection counter. And the prediction is that the well-known uh, hype is that by 2020, there will be between 20 and 50 billion of interconnected devices. Um, so this basically brings us to the importance of embedded devices and their firmware, uh, because the embedded devices are ubiquitous. Even though they are invisible, they, they are essential to our, our lives. Think about uh, pacemakers, think about ECUs in the cars. Uh, they can operate for many years, for example, for smart infrastructure, if it's buried in uh, concrete or is put somewhere in the uh, out of reach uh, area, they should operate and they could operate for years even without getting no updates or no security updates. And they have a large attack surface because those devices 
uh, do not have normal uh, mouse, keyboards, input-output systems like uh, keyboard, mouse, and monitors. So they need some kind of web interfaces, networking interfaces, and debugging interfaces so that they're able to, to, to operate easily. And it's not news that embedded devices are insecure. We've been seeing this trend from, I guess, 2005 or 2006 when uh, increasingly more every day the, the, there are examples of embedded devices being insecure, like a lot of routers being insecure, then printers shown to be insecure on large scale, then VoIP phones and VoIP systems used in offices, uh, cars uh, shown back and even in present shown to be remotely hackable and insecure, drones, fireworks, all kinds of PLC, SCADA, uh, industrial control systems, and the thing can, can go on because there's actually no uh, limit on the type of or application of embedded devices, and we can go on the blogs and on the reports and white papers and see every type of embedded device have some kind of a flow. But what is the observation here is that most, mo most of these white papers or research was done in a manual, or not necessarily just in a manual, but it was like every research, research was done in an individual manner, like taking a particular device or a particular uh, embedded firmware and analyzing it uh, head to end. And basically, it involves a lot of uh, tedious work, a lot of manual work, uh, a lot of scripting. And basically, it's, it, it cannot scale. If you want to understand what are the security of 50 billion, security implications of 50 billion of uh, connected devices or security flows in hundreds of thousands uh, of firmware images, we need scalable approaches. And these approaches where we do a lot of things manually just does not scale. I, I'll try to give a very quick overview uh, of how usually the manual analysis process of uh, firmware takes place. Uh, and for most of you, maybe it's not uh, something new, and for sure it's not. But the idea is that there's uh, a firmware package. You download it, you get it on your CD, you get it on your USB stick, or you pay hundreds of uh, euros and get it on, on a fancy SD card if it's a SCADA or ICS system. You unpack or decrypt. And if you cannot decrypt, it's not a problem. You keep it, and someday somebody will dump the key, and you will be able to decrypt it and go back and do the process as if the firmware was decrypted, unencrypted. Then there's uh, very generic steps like detecting the CPU or the type of binary, uh, the load addresses, detecting, uh, and then applying some kind of a static analysis on the code or the source uh, code of interpreted files, and dynamic analysis. And then looking for some kinds of uh, patterns, uh, either in form of uh, strings or function names or symbols, or just chunks of codes, which people try to do now with machine learning uh, and intermediate language. But the idea is to try to find these kind of backdoors or debug interfaces or UART consoles or known or ob obvious wounds. This can be st done statically or usually can be done also dynamically, but it requires more effort as we'll go through. Then, if you didn't have a device, you have to buy the device. Some people do it otherwise. They have a device, they dump the firmware, and then they start as if we started with the firmware itself. But in general case, if you want to do uh, analysis on some devices, you don't want to buy every device every now and then just to analyze. So you want to start as cheap as possible, and the cheapest start as possible is getting the firmware free from the internet. And then if you find some indication that there's vulnerabilities, you will want to buy the device, you have to set up the device, meaning all the cabling, all the network configurations, all the uh, drum base, right? And then eventually, if you need to go even deeper or some vulnerabilities might require some physical inter uh, intervention, you might need to even go and disassemble. So clearly there are two parts of this uh, manual analysis process. And we can see that the part of buying the device, setting up the device, and disassembling it to go to its JTAG or UART console or just hook up on the microprocessors or uh, flash memory is, is hard to automate because 
you don't have so much budget to buy all the devices, just go on Amazon and buy random de devices that you think might be vulnerable. Uh, and second, it's not very easy to, to set up all the devices in a uniform unless you have a very smart robot, maybe in a few years we'll have them. And also not very easy to automatically disassemble the device and go some robots uh, to connect to the JTAGs and UART and find them. There are some steps towards that direction to automate this with JTAGulators and some, some move, 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 moving parts to try to detect these URs, but still it's like a hard problem, it's hard to automate. On the other, si on the other side, we see that uh, the first part is more or less easy to automate because getting the firmware is nothing than just going to a download link, that eventually logging in if it requires a username and password, downloading it, then trying to unpack it. If it doesn't work with a simple zip, you can uh, use the brute force method, you just brute force, and I'll show you some examples. And then you just try to do some heuristic, you detect some things which you might uh, want to optimize, uh, for your analysis, and then you just do static and dynamic analysis. Of course, there are some caveats for both of the, uh, for all of these steps, but clearly this, as a process, as a as a thought, can be automated. So, going from this point forward, we have this idea to to have a large-scale automated analysis to better understand and classify and analyze firmware images uh, without using the devices. That is very important because we don't actually need these devices because most of them can be with more or less effort emulated if we really need to, to confirm something or not. So there are some challenges like the large number of devices, the large number of firmware files. These are the challenges which uh, have to be overcome. Uh, also, the thing that uh, the IoT and the embedded devices, they are using uh, different kinds of architecture. Of course, the most well-known are ARM and MIPS and PowerPC maybe, but there's myriads of other microcontrollers and microprocessors which you really don't know uh, what they are, and also not necessarily all of them use Linux, so you would need to know where to load that bytecode and so on. Uh, and basically, we also have a highly unstructured firmware data. Even though you can go and download all the files on the internet, you need to know what is what, because uh, otherwise you end up in a very uh, inefficient, uh, very inefficient uh, brute forcing process. And you need to be really focused when you have a lot of data. Uh, so to overcome this, these challenges, we have uh, some solution, we propose some solutions, such as uh, for the large number of devices, the first thing we want to do, no devices analysis. So we try to do no devices. The large number of firmware files, basically, we need to analyze a lot of data. OK, we need to devise scalable architectures. Uh, because uh, the systems are heterogeneous, we need to devise techniques which are uh, generic enough, which do not depend on particular uh, CPU architecture or uh, hardware architecture. We want to be either on the intermediate le level or have some, some, some uh, specialized techniques but we can, from which we can pivot. Then there's uh, a focus on uh, web and network interfaces and APIs because all these devices, they expose these network interfaces and APIs and in particular they expose the web interface as a mean to remote management or remote access to the device. Uh, having highly unstructured firmware data, we propose that you need to do a large data set classification, meaning that you use machine learning to classify the firmwares and so on. And we'll show some examples of this. So first, uh, first challenge, like firmware and device classification. Uh, why, why is that a challenge? Uh, we know that, again, there's hundreds of thousands of firmware uh, packages. And of course, I don't see many volunteers in the room to manually triage and uh, classify them. And we basically propose machine learning, uh, and we, in particular, in our case, we used scikit-learn uh, Python package. And we try to evaluate our approach. The idea is that if you have firmware files, and these firmware files usually are specific to devices, so if there, a device, if there is a device which has a particular number of uh, 
uh, megabytes for uh, flash, then the firmware file, if it's a full update, will have more or less 16 megabytes, right? So there are these kind of firmware properties like file size, file entropy, some strings, and so on, which makes those firmwares particular to that device or that vendor. So these are kind of the, the properties of the files, uh, firmware files, which we use, like file size, entropy value, how dense it is, uh, the, the strings inside, and unique strings in uh, each category. And then we try to use these as features in uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, random forests, and decision trees. And we did some, some uh, sampling. And we found that, in our case, uh, what worked the best was uh, the random forest uh, with uh, size entropy, strings, and strings unique features. And I know it sounds a little bit uh, too much for this presentation, uh, but you can find the de details in, in, uh, in the papers, which are at the end of the, the slides, how these features were chosen and how they are generated. But the idea is that if we, for example, include another feature of firmers which is not very uh, good, then we have the classification of firmers or detection of firmers not very accurate. So in our case, we've been able to achieve more than 90% uh, accurate uh, detection of firmware uh, by vendor or by vendor and uh, product. So it helps us because we can basically say from this big number of firmers, let's put this in chunks, and we have uh, firmers from vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, and then we can apply specific unpacking techniques or specific known exploits to test if those uh, firmers are vulnerable or not, because we know it's vendor A or B or C. Uh, so this is our local optimum, uh, where I list the feature is the same as on the, on the slide. Uh, and the idea is that uh, I can try to give you, I'll, I'll show a demo at, at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, so, so the next challenge is the automated static analysis. So the idea is that if you have a large number of uh, firmers, you want to do, to do the analysis as quick as possible and automated as possible. So in the first instance, what we did, we took uh, the files which we crawled, the several hundred thousand firmers, we put them in a database, uh, we developed some uh, processing, unpacking, and analysis nodes, and basically you can scale it inside your uh, own uh, uh, organization, or you can scale it to Amazon Web Services, uh, to whatever number of nodes you need, and basically, these nodes, what they do, they just receive a firmware, they try to unpack using binwalk or using binary analysis toolkit. Uh, these are two very awesome tools. You can combine them or write your own. Uh, and then you unpack the files, you get the file system if you're lucky. If not, you can write your own unpackers and plug them into binwalk and binary analysis toolkit and scale it to many numbers of uh, nodes. Uh, then we do some simple static analysis, like uh, collecting uh, default or backdoor passwords or un unusual passwords, or we try to, to see if there are uh, private certificates, private uh, files and, uh, which are in the firmware and should not be there. Then we also store this in a firmware analysis and reports database and do some data enrichment, which I'll come down later. So what kinds of static analysis we perform in the first place? We do check for web server configuration. We didn't run any static code analysis because it was our first experiment. We didn't know what exactly to expect, what was the percentage of uh, CPU architectures, what was the percentage of uh, operating systems. And uh, it's really hard to have a full set of tools, especially if you work open source or free software, uh, to, to tackle all these challenges. Then we also look for credentials, uh, weak, default, or hard-coded in ETC password, or we look for basically for strings in the firmware, and then we try to map them to hash, uh, hashes in ETC password, and we found like dozens of them where the, the string, string inside the firmware is actually a password for an entry in ETC hash. 
We also use the versions and uh, keywords. For example, versions are useful if you want to, to test statically or dynamically if a particular OpenSSL library shipped in a firmware is uh, vulnerable or not. Uh, the thing is that just getting the firmware version is not enough because uh, you never know whether the library or the software package was compiled uh, with a particular set of options or was uh, privately patched by the vendor and the vulnerability is not there. So if you have a CVE, it might not work just because of this simple reason, because they privately patched it or they compile it in a way that it doesn't trigger. So version is just an indication of what you might be looking for, but it's not like a definite hit. And then we also use some correlation, which I'll show uh, some examples of them. We use uh, the strings, we use the fuzzy hashes and private SSL keys. The fuzzy hash is an uh, interesting thing. Basically, is uh, a forensic technique which compares files uh, by their similarity. They do not compare it uh, one to one as in crypto hashes. So it gives you uh, an idea if there is a common file in different uh, firmware packages and there's some uh, small modification between vendors. And it makes it easy to find cross-vendor bugs, uh, as I'll show in, in a second. So in one example, we had this uh, firmware uh, SD card uh, Wi-Fi firmware. So basically, these are SD cards which have Wi-Fi chips uh, in them. And uh, there was a known vulnerability in, in it, uh, like command uh, injection and XSS. We know that this particular file in, fir in that firmware is vulnerable. Then when we uh, do fuzzy hash uh, analysis, we see that there's few other, like firmware 2 and firmware uh, 3 and firmware 5 and firmware 4, which have similar files, and we try to correlate them by fuzzy hash. And we see that some files are uh, similar by fuzzy hash. So if this particular file is vulnerable to XSS or uh, remote code injection, then the other two, because of their similarity, they might be as well. So this is a very good indication that you should pivot from firmware 1 to firmware 2 and firmware 4, and testing for exactly the same vulnerabilities or exploits. And uh, the thing is that sometimes you, you get different vendors hit by the same bug just because it's a white label product, and uh, they buy an SDK or a development kit, and they use the very same vulnerable uh, software packages. Another example which we uh, found interesting is that we had the private, uh, we had HTTPS uh, certificates in the firmware, and they had private uh, keys along with them, which is a mistake, but okay, whatever. You might think that maybe at the first boot they regenerate uh, the SSL certificates. Uh, we look it up in the, our database, we see that this particular SSL certificate corresponds to uh, CCTV vendor A, and we actually found some vulnerabilities in this vendor way. Uh, going forward, we take ZMAP outputs, and they have uh, the HTTPS ecosystem scan. What we do, we try to correlate the same uh, the fingerprint of the certificates in the IPv4 uh, fingerprints. And we find that actually the same fingerprint, which is uh, from the certificate in a firmware file, is found online, and by random sampling, uh, we found that some of these uh, online devices which use the HTTPS certificate, they uh, actually come from a vendor B, and the conclusion is that most likely these two vendors are affected by the same vulnerability we found in the first place by analyzing the firmware. And you can go and pivot from vendor A and basically go and exploit vendor B's uh, devices which are online. And one example of this is I'll just show you. This is this particular example. So you can see that it is a Promelit sentry. It's a CCTV camera. And you can see that it's a Promelit sentry, right? And that's that particular example I was talking about. But when you see it, the SSL certificate, it's Bricom. And I'll show you a dynamic analysis of Bricom device and how we, we, we do it. So the idea is that if you have these kind of situations where you have uh, devices labeled by different uh, vendors but have vulnerabilities which you don't know, you will not know if you don't do it at a large scale. 
you'll just focus on the BrickCom devices and you'll think only BrickCom is, uh, is vulnerable. And to give you an idea is that I have a virtual machine. Uh, you can see that I have uh, the same IP, but different ports, 3080, 4080, and 2080. So I started with a BrickCom. And you see that in that virtual machine, I'm running a emulated uh, firmware, which I'll explain a little bit down later. But what I want to say is that uh, once we have uh, vendor A, let's say BrickCom firmware, and we can do dynamic analysis, we can uh, emulate it and find vulnerabilities inside it, we can easily find automated exploits and use them against ven vendor B. And we can do admin, admin, and you can see that this is basically an automated emulated system which emulates automatically this firmware from this particular CCTV vendor. And you can do pretty much. In our case, we focused on the web interfaces, and I'll go uh, into details a little bit later. But I want to show you that it's possible to do dynamic analysis as well, not just looking for SSL certificates and do this in an auto automated manner. And you can see that the, the web interface is pretty responsive. And you can do, uh, you can, uh, yeah, you, you see? I mean, this is really awesome. You, you find bugs like that, right? And uh, that's, that's the thing that uh, you can uh, start penetration testing tools like Arachne, like uh, W3AF, or your preferred commercial tool, and it will easily find the XSSs and uh, remote code injections and uh, remote command injections and SQLs, whatever that multi interface might have. OK, so it was a small parenthesis. Uh, so in that case of these BrickCom cameras, we found one certificate. Uh, we've, and we have found one vulnerability which was important, and we correlated it to two vendors, and f correlated to a total of 35,000 online devices. And we have, uh, at that time, back in 2014, we had 109 private S RSA uh, keys, which were without passphrase, and we can uh, skim the fingerprints and go look around on the internet using uh, Shodan or Census, uh, whatever your system is. So as, as a first result from that very simple, not, not very complex uh, static analysis, like no code static analysis, we found 38 new vulnerabilities like XSSs, backdoors, uh, non-trivial default or hard-coded passwords, uh, which affected around 700 firmware images. And we correlated some of these uh, vulnerabilities to around 140 online devices using Shodan uh, and Google Dorks. So the last challenge we had, or we tried to, to tackle, is the automated dynamic analysis, like a sneak peek, uh, what I have shown you uh, on the firmware emulation of the BrickCom cameras. Uh, so the idea is that we have these uh, unpacked firmware sources, or you might have tons of them unpacked, let's say. Then you want to select some of them to do dynamic analysis. Your selection criteria might vary. In our case, we selected the ones which had clearly a web interface inside. And we could start the web interface because usually the web interface is the first thing which ends up on the internet when you plug your device to your router or to your direct connection. And this is the thing you usually want to access to manage your device remotely, unless you use uh, some smartphone application, but which basically does the same through the cloud and piggybacks on, on some HTTP connection to your, uh, to your device. So we selected these. Uh, we do some file system preparation because if you did a lot of firmware unpacking, you'll know how messy it is. Uh, and especially when you have hundreds of thousands of files uh, or very diverse, then automatically unpacking and extracting, you'll get a lot of uh, false positive, a lot of junk data a lot of uh, broken uh, files just because uh, the unpacker was brute forcing too much or uh, maybe just because uh, they used a slightly different settings of the packer for the firmware. For example, for SquashFS or for JFFS2, 
they use big endian, little endian with some specific options, and then the unpackers, the default unpackers, do not work out of the box. So the, the file system sometimes are broken, and you need some heuristics to broke the sim links. You need some heuristics to to find that some files are not properly there and try to make them uh, as good as possible so that your emulation will be successful. Then what you do, you also try to do it scalable. Like the static analysis, you want to do the dynamic analysis as well. It's a little bit slower because it involves both emulation on a much slower uh, emulator, and then also it involves dynamic analysis tools, basically which are fuzzers or penetration testing tools which uh, send a lot of input. Uh, and uh, we perform this uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, using QEMU, we collect the results and we use it for machine learning and for improving the analysis or analyzing why the particular uh, emulation or uh, failed. Maybe there was a kernel problem or maybe they are missing kernel modules. And this might happen a lot because not all firmware packages are full firmware packages. You must know that most of the firmwares are kind of partial updates. Most of the vendors, they just send you a diff or uh, the updates of the impacted files. They do not send you every time the whole image of the file system. And that's why sometimes you, you, you need to know why the emulation or analysis is failing. But the idea is that the, the challenging thing is how, how do you scalably or uh, scalably emulate heterogeneous architectures or in general how you automatically emulate because if you do it by hand it's funny but you get tired after half a day then we need to choose an emulator and um, there are lots of options how to do the emulation or the analysis so there would be the ideal emulator but the problem it doesn't exist and when i'm talking about ideal emulation is the emulator which you give it a file and it will automatically know the architecture and will be able to emulate the CPU, will automatically know the operating system, and will know how to boot it, and will know at which addresses, basically, to load all these files. But from what we know publicly, some such thing is not available. Then, uh, generic system emulators, it's the QEMU, and there are two options to use it with uh, original firmware and the original kernel or with uh, original firmware and generic kernel. The problem is that not, very, uh, not many firmware come with a kernel update. Most of them, if you look at them, they're on kernel 2.6 10 years ago. So they do not update very often the kernels, and you'll not get them uh, very often in the firmware update. So this means that you'll have to e either extract it by JTAG or use some manual uh, process which doesn't scale. And in that case, the generic kernel uh, approach, where you have a generic kernel built with all the possible modules and options, would uh, be a better idea. And then there are some uh, other options where you can just take the application you want to test, and you don't test it in an emulator, but you load it in a uh, test environment, which is uh, different from the emulated environment. And this works very well for interpreted languages like PHP, Perl, uh, and things like that, basically uh, where there is a virtualization environment and you can replicate the virtualization environment without putting all the QEMU uh, kitchen soup uh, in there. Uh, again, uh, we had to make some choices. The uh, perfect emulator doesn't exist, so we cannot use it. Uh, not many firmwares uh, have uh, kernels inside, so we cannot use it. And this is, was too experimental. The details about architectural CH root are in the paper. Uh, I'll not bore you now with this, but you can look, look it up what exactly it is. So we used these two approaches using the original firmware with a generic kernel. And uh, in cases where it applies to basically strip the whole document root, uh, if it's a Perl or a PHP, and put it in a uh, x86 uh, test environment and uh, run it there under Apache or Light HTTPD. Now, the idea is that you have uh, the Q QEMU, uh, which runs inside the normal machine, or it can run uh, inside the VM. In our case, it runs in our inside the VM. Uh, we, be, uh, we run on top of Debian. These are technical details, but then we throw the firmware inside the QEMU, 
and we ch root. The ch root is the procedure where basically you change the root file system, the perceived root file system of the, of the environment you are working on, and you can basically say to the QEMU that from now on, uh, the root of the firmware file is your root file system, and you can basically use the environment from the firmware as if it was being provided by QEMU. So in this way, you kind of can easily emulate. There are caveats with that, but it works pretty well for many firmwares. Then you just, uh, because you are in CH root environment, you just uh, bootstrap everything with init, Linux, RC, and so on, and leave it uh, run. Of course, some of them will fail because there's no device uh, attached to QEMU because you need to write uh, some uh, plugins for QEMU in order to emulate the flash memory, the EEPROM memory, the serial port, the Ethernet. Luckily, the uh, networking is pretty okay done in QEMU and it works fine, but for the others, you need to basically write a good set of uh, plugin libraries which would be able to accommodate most of your devices. And once you have that, you can uh, basically overcome those failures. And then you just uh, fire the web server, whether it's a uh, BOA, LightHTTPD, THTPD, and so on, uh, or it's a standalone binary. And then uh, you just uh, interested in that part. In our case, we are interested in web server part. And then we just plug the Arachne, Zap, uh, W3AF penetration testing tools. Uh, we use TCP dump in order to recover all the communication to be able to roll back and find what uh, input trigger a particular exploit uh, or a particular crash or a particular command injection. Uh, you can use Nmap, you can use Metasploit and Nessus and basically fire all your uh, arsenal of tools on the emulated systems, on the ports you want to, to work on. In our case, we focused on the web interfaces, so we, we use these tools. And as a result, uh, we, we had uh, around 225 high severity vulnerabilities, meaning command injection, XSS, and CSRF, uh, impacting around 10% of the original data set we've, been, uh, we've started from. And these uh, vulnerabilities impacted 25% of the vendors. The idea is that we didn't develop uh, this framework to find all the vulnerabilities. But if you have such a framework, and you can find uh, the low-hanging fruit very fast in one day and, and kill basically or close 10% of your vulnerabilities if you are a vendor, then it's a very useful tool. Or if you are a pen tester, you want to find all these things quickly. You don't want to spend all your days just going uh, manually and try to emulate manually. You just leave it overnight, you come in the morning, you have uh, 225 reports uh, on 200 firmers, and your job is done for the day. Right? No? Okay, so uh, uh, I showed you like part of this demo. Uh, I, I mean, uh, this is uh, uh, the Brickcom camera. Uh, there are some uh, things you can uh, play with, but what I wanted to show is that uh, the, the, the process of starting from the firmware and going to the, to the correlation uh, and then finding the, the interesting sting, things. So for example, if you have uh, the analysis on, uh, on these uh, files, for example, you can correlate by, by string and uh, you, you can see that some of the firmwares, in particular HP, for example, uh, they had some, some firmware which they pulled, from, pulled out from the internet for I don't know what reason which contained this error, failed to open backdoor net channel. I don't know what it means, but I think it's very, not very funny. So if you have this kind of, you can search by keywords, and you, you will be amazed how many firmwares actually hit on the keyword backdoor. Some of them, of course, are these snort or IDS rules, which look for keyword backdoor, and these rules uh, basically give you a hit. But sometimes you actually find real backdoors by searching for the word backdoor, <laughs> right? Now, I mean, they understood that this is very obvious, and uh, if you know the story of Juniper, they started to use cryptograms. But I mean, if you have this kind of cryptograms, you can uh, also start looking around at these firmware files 
and then you look at the firmware details and what's the name, what's the version, and you can pivot from there. Uh, you can also look for those uh, dual EC keys uh, if they are present in this firmware or other firmwares. Uh, but uh, to give you an example of the fuzzy hash thing, as I mentioned you in the slides, um, somewhere here. Okay, so this is the fu fuzzy hash where I mentioned the SD cards and correlation of files. And the idea is that I can, uh, I'll keep it shorter. We know this file is vulnerable in, in one, of the, one of the SD cards. Uh, it was very well known blog post. We can look it by fuzzy hash and we can actually see that this file uh, is present in these firmers, okay? There is some, some of them, and there is nothing particular because they are just incremental versions of uh, the same device firmware. And we can also see that it's 100% similarity, so it means this file didn't change uh, across versions. But the interesting thing is that you see that at, for some entries, the vendor changed. And you can easily automate uh, to trigger you an alert or to basically pivot automatically when you have a similarity hit uh, for one file across vendors. When it goes across vendors, you know that something is fishy. It means that the other vendor uh, must be vulnerable. And you see that the similarity is not 100%, it's 46. This is because uh, these vendors of SD cards, they take the white label or SDKs or development kits, and they put their logo and their copyright uh, text. So there's some change in the, in the output or in the uh, files. But the idea is that the core functionality stays the same. They, they never touch the uh, core functionality the, uh, of the web server or of the kernel. They just update their copyrights, and that's it. That's why there is not full f uh, similarity, but there is some similarity. So if you look at this file, is uh, PQI Air, and this uh, version 147. But the idea is that okay, once you have this knowledge that uh, this file is vulnerable, and you have two vendors, you can just try to emulate both of them and see whether they are vulnerable. And in one case, you see it's the same IP, it's the same virtual machine, it's Transcend Wi-Fi SD. I can kill it like that. The idea is that with uh, another parenthesis is that you, uh, having this kind of emulation, you can also find very uh, quickly bugs like un unauthorized access, right? So you see that it asks me for a password, but if I go to this page, it's, it's automatically like this. So you see that you don't need like a very sophisticated thing and you can use these uh, uh, pen testing tools or plugins for pen testing tools to find these kind of vulnerabilities very easily and basically generates CV reports every, every minute. Uh, okay, we can uh, log in. Uh, Sometimes the, the thing is, uh, the interfaces are broken because you see for, there is no MAC address. Right, because it tries to call some IOCTL, which is not supported by QEMU, and you need to write a plugin in order to, to support all these kind of IOCTL. But the idea is that you can still find vulnerabilities. Uh, if you go, see, there's Arachne name. Arachne name is because now the Arachne uh, is, uh, is, pe is pen testing this, uh, this uh, machine. Uh, Okay, so it, it used to pen test this machine. I, I can do a very quick uh, thing. Like that. <laughs> Bam. So basically you see that using the emulator you don't need to buy that expensive 40, 50 euro card. You can find the vulnerability. And the same way you can, it's just a very quick example, but you can find also, we found uh, the same command injection, which took some time for the guy to find and write the write-up, but automatically it's easy to find. Now we go to KCARD, uh, uh, which is basically the PQI Air, and we can go to Wi-Fi setup, and uh, 
try to to do the same. I mean, it's basically the same uh, the same page in the back because it's a parallel, but the output is different. That's why I told you the similarity is different. Uh, because if you look at the source, no, not this one, uh, frame source. You see that there is uh, this K card uh, everywhere. So basically, they use this K card SDK thing. Um, And you see that it's basically the same. The idea is that you can find exactly the same vulnerability, exactly in the same files, kcard edit, whatever it name it is. Uh, very simple by just triggering the tools. And basically, the pen testing tools will do this for you because it fuzz for everything, for XSS, for command injection, for path traversals, for file inclusions, and so on. So basically, that's, uh, that's the, the idea. I'll Guess I'll conclude now, and uh, we'll leave some uh, minutes for for questions. But the idea is that I can assure you that there are plenty of latent vulnerabilities in embedded firmware. Why it means latent? Because they are there; they just wait to be discovered. And many of the firmwares are old as hell, uh, or even if they get updated, we see cases where. Uh, they ship in a 2014-2015 firmware update, a 10-year-old BusyBox or uh, Linux kernel version. I mean, uh, firmware security uh, analysis uh, as is absolutely necessary, is another conclusion, and we see it by every day, because the, uh, the day that Juniper backdoor uh, popped out, everybody started analyzing the firmware of Juniper OS, right? So I've we, 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 we think and we also we agree that the firmware security analysis is absolutely uh, necessary and a broader view on the firmware, not just a very particular view on this set of firmware, is not just beneficial but is necessary because you can see that you can relate the same vulnerabilities or different vendors and you can actually discover the, the big surface, the big impact. Uh, you never know when we'll find those dual EC keys in other firmwares, and you'll be surprised that actually not just Juniper OS was, uh, was affected by that uh, backdoor or whatever. This is just an example. Uh, but of course, it involves many untrivial steps and challenges. We have to overcome them uh, in some ways. Sometimes we take uh, shortcuts and we don't get the 100% results, but as long as we get some vulnerabilities, it's, it's important. And that we, we also see that for many vendors, uh, in particular, the white labels, but not just white labels, it's also the big corporates who buy the white labels, that uh, security is clearly not a priority. Uh, that it's a trade-off with uh, cost and time to market, and they prefer not to invest a lot and actually be first uh, to market, and they completely ignore the security. Uh, so this is, these are my references. Uh, you are more welcome to, to read them, share, or retweet, or cite them in your papers or studies, uh, or uh, give me a sign if you need uh, any question uh, or any advice or you have an idea. I'm, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be around or you'll reach me an, on my email. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues with whom I've done parts of this uh, research and work. Uh, Jonas Zadach, uh, Aurelien Francillon, David Balzarot, and Apostolis Zaras. And uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm ready to take them. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk, and we're taking questions now for 10 minutes, and if you absolutely have to leave the room, please do so as quietly as possible. Um, okay, so just walk up to one of the microphones um, on my left or on the right um, and ask away. Uh -huh. We start with the microphone to my right, please. Hi, thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I was wondering if because uh, because you don't always uh, actually purchase a device and actually test es exploits directly on a device if you have um, trouble with vendors um, acknowledging or being willing to receive uh, uh, vulnerabilities that haven't actually been tested against the physical device. 
Um, okay, so I'll repeat the question whether uh, the fact that we don't always buy the devices and we don't test on actual devices, whether the vendors are uh, willing to take those reports in and address those vulnerabilities? This yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually the, 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 the talk today, I wanted, I had, uh, the plan was to, to drop some zero days in some of the routers, but because uh, vendors actually listen or started to listen, uh, we'll have to delay uh, some of those. So the short answer is yes, most of the vendors start right now looking at these reports, even though they are not tested on real devices, they look at these reports. And we provide as much detail as possible regarding how we found them and what is the uh, triggering input or what is the exploitation uh, methodology. And if they are not willing to take it in a responsible disclosure manner, uh, then it's becoming full disclosure after the timeout. And OK. Um, otherwise, uh, I don't see. But yeah, uh, to confirm is, is that uh, vendors started looking at, uh, at these reports, at least in our case. And uh, it's good. They don't have a zero day. Maybe they have time to fix it. Great. Thank you. OK, uh, another question from the microphone to my father. Um, congratulations on a great talk. Thank you. Um, will, uh, did you actually write uh, KeyMU devices? And if so, will you make them public? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm not a very KeyMU guy. Uh, Dr. Jonas Zadak, my colleague, he is a very good KeyMU guy who is actually working on binary dynamic translation and analysis. And he, he actually writes those plugins to map those devices. And I warmly recommend to contact him if you have any question regarding this thing. In our methodology, we just used bare metal QEMU. But the idea is that once you have a library of uh, QEMU plugins or devices, it's just uh, easy breezy to plug them in and uh, basically broaden your uh, testing surface. Thank you. So we have one question from the internet, if I'm correct. Uh, yes. So JNX asks, are all the features you mentioned today available in firmware.re? Uh, and also, is the project open source or readily available for download? OK, so uh, there are two questions. Uh, whether the firmware are available to be downloaded and whether it's uh, open source. First. Uh, we, can, we can share some of the metadata and information about the firmware, but we cannot share the firmwares themselves because of the copyright. I mean, we, don't, we are not distributors of software, and usually this fires back if you start putting them on your site. This fires back with legal claims that you are uh, distributing illegally software, which you are not entitled to, and this is kind of a tricky situation. But to address this, if anybody wants to run a specific uh, test or analysis on the data we have, just drop me an email, I'll try to accommodate, I'll run your script, or I'll try to, to, to give you access on our unpack environment where you can run it. So this is the first question. And second, uh, the project is, uh, well, is not intended to be run as open, uh, to be released as open source, it's more intended to be run as a service where we can give back uh, to the community as much information as we can, and uh, at the same time, try to, to improve our uh, things. Basically, is not rocket science what we've implemented and is well described technically in the paper. Uh, it's just a distribution of uh, jobs and uh, so on. Uh, we sometime also co uh, contribute uh, commits or uh, bugs or improvements to some of these tools like Beanwalk or uh, Binary Analysis Toolkit. So in that sense, yes, we contribute also to the co uh, open source community. OK, we'll take two more questions. So please, to my left. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. And actually, I have two questions. And the first short, short question is that how long does it take usually for the dynamic analysis on the formers? Okay, find so, vulnerabilities. Okay, so so to, to emulate it, uh, it, 
it takes okay we we take some some uh, measure of precautions we're having some dead times where we we do weights or sleeps just to make sure that all the setup is fine because you you cannot expect a consistent or constant time from QEMU running in different virtual machines running on different hardware across the globe so you don't have a consistent uh, time uh, but in general is uh, to to start a QEMU for a particular image takes around i don't know up to 5 minutes yeah. depending what it has to load and what devices it can or, or cannot find or all, all kinds of faults. And to pen test it, uh, it also depends uh, on, uh, okay, what kind of dynamic analysis. In our case, we, uh, we run the pen testing and we use the XSS, CSRF, and OS, uh, OS command injection modules from Arachne. And they, uh, they, they take quite some time. They generate around 10,000, 20,000 fuzzing inputs per each class. And uh, basically, it takes around uh, half half an hour, one hour to 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 test. Can I have one more question? Yeah. Uh, wait. Okay. I think we should take the ones waiting over there for a long time. So. Uh, okay. First of all, thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, thank you. I have uh, many questions, but I will, I have selected one that uh, is most uh, for me interesting. How would it go about uh, scaling the uh, the firmware retrieval part, because uh, from some of your slides, uh, I took um, the thought that your current um, sample size is about uh, 2,000 firmware images, is that right? Uh, and uh, actually, how do you go about uh, loading uh, and processing all of the uh, firmware from different um, routers, which are not publicly available, and it seems that it involves like manually Googling for the website to f download the firmware. And, um, and so this, this was the first one. And the second one, uh, what is your current sample size? OK, so uh, current sample size, we, we have uh, the, the collected sample size, which we used for the first study. And it, it was around one, estimated to around 170,000 firmware images. OK. 170,000 firmware images, which we crawled using the Google uh, custom searches or using FTP spiders and FTP indexing sites. And we just took uh, a seed of 500 FTPs and vendor sites and start uh, crawling everything. And then we just filtered out the, the weed, basically the PDFs, documentation, uh, drivers, and so on. And we ended up with 170,000 files. Now, uh, we did the static analysis on 32,000 uh, unpacked files because academic deadlines do not usually meet with uh, our desires. So we had to cut some lines and do on a shorter uh, scale the static analysis and the dynamic analysis as well because it takes uh, much more time to emulate and pen test all this. We did it on 2,000 uh, firmware images. We tried to emulate and uh, find web vulnerabilities in around 2,000. OK, so this is basically the, the breakdown of the sample size. Now, how do we do about the files we cannot uh, get? Of course, there will be always files behind the paywall, a registration wall, or uh, which are not available if you are not registered as a customer or as a reseller and so on. That's why we have this service where people can drop them. And uh, as we move forward, we'll try to perform machine learning as well uh, to classify them and also to analyze them and give results back, not just on the files we have. Uh, and from the public interface, uh, we collected around 2,200 files, uh, around 10 gigs of data, so around 50 megs per file. But there are some, some bogus files as well. People just drop some movies and MP3s. Uh. OK, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so we cannot take any more questions. Thank you for being here this morning, and enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you.